I'm Jit Mangwani. I'm one of the consultants in uh, uh, the UK, in the University Hospital of Leicester. Um, I was tasked to do a foot and ankle course um, last year when I was here on my holiday by this man, who you all know is Sanjay Chaturvedi, who is uh, organizing secretary of the IOCON this year. And how did it all come about? I went back and I spoke to a few people in the UK. Um, Chris Blendell, who is the chair of the Education Committee for both of us. Patricia Allen, who is my senior colleague. Harry, who you all know, um, he's a, are you Indian foot and ankle surgeon or UK foot and ankle surgeon? Because he's so many times here trying to sort of promote foot and ankle education. Um, so that's the UK side. Mark has always been very supportive. Uh, of what we've done um, here. So Simon Henderson, who was then uh, president of the Bofras, um, I had a chat with him and unfortunately he can't make it uh, because of his personal health. Nothing too, too uh, worrying, um, thankfully. So we then talked to Dr. Rajiv Shah, Dr. Uh, Professor Mandeep Dillon here, and um, Indian faculty, Sampat uh, Dumre and Balvinder Rana and Amit and Dr. Ravi Mittal. So essentially we sort of formed a core group of people who are interested in foot and ankle on both sides of uh, um, the countries and so we essentially talked about what will be the best way forward to take it as a course, as a workshop just before the IOCON. And the program has been carefully selected and everybody has contributed. Harry's you know, done a great work of forming the first draft. Dr. Rajiv Shah has contributed. Everybody else has looked at the program. So it is designed to cater for the local pathology um, and also look at some modern aspects of foot and ankle. Um, I just want to say a couple of words about ethos of a course or a workshop. We're not in a conference setting here. We don't have thousands of people attending and I'm not presenting anything that you know, I've sort of done a groundbreaking research and it's five minutes talk and you'll be all done. We're in a very relaxed environment for a workshop, for a, for a course, and we really want to make it useful for everyone. Numbers are limited um, to a certain degree so, so that we can have a one-to-one um, -one interaction, faculty to delegate interaction, and the questions you always think about and you think, oh, I, you know, there were a thousand people and I couldn't ask that question. That shouldn't be the case here. The, you should all be opening up to say, this is the problem I've got in my practice. Would, what would you do? So there's plenty of experience, wealth of experience, with all the guys who do foot and ankle surgery. Please feel free to interact both formally here and informally outside for your, in your breaks and things. Um, it is about understanding principles more than actually you know, looking at some rocket science uh, foot and ankle things. So understanding principles of how to diagnose foot and ankle conditions how to treat them, how to get it right the first time, and learning some new and modern techniques which you know, have been introduced in the last sort of 20 years, 10 years, and taking it forward for your local um, po patient population and application of those techniques. It's not just the delegates. Every time I go uh, to a course um, to deliver a lecture or something, I pick up one or two things that I think are very useful for my own practice. So, you know, everybody benefits from this sort of environment of a course or a workshop. And the end result is we, we're here to understand uh, the principles and skills that we're going to learn so that we can put it into our own practice for our, for, for our own patient's benefit. So the, whatever we got for two days essentially is designed to actually have three or four or five things that you're going to pick up that you are going to take home and think, I am going to use this in my normal practice because I've not done it up until now but these are five things that I'm going to use for my patients now. Now I'm hopeful that we will have that feeling by tomorrow evening that we, we've got something that we've not learnt about before. So I'm going to just introduce faculty. Um, you know who I am. I'm Jit Mangwani. I'm at the Leicester Hospital uh, in the UK. Simon Henderson unfortunately couldn't make it because of his personal health. Harry, if I can ask you to uh, stand up and get yourself known, not that you need any introduction. Um, Harry is in Newport, um, Karthik Harriet, and he's uh, you know, one of the eminent foot and ankle surgeons uh, in the UK across the world. Um, Patricia Allen, who's my senior colleague, um, again, 
a well-known figure, Secretary of the British Orthopedic Foot and Ankle Society now, um, and you know we all know how, how good she is. Chris Blundell um, from Sheffield, um, Chairman of the Education Committee uh, of British Orthopedic Foot and Ankle Society, and Mark Davis, who is on the Scientific Committee, again from Sheffield. Um, Professor Dillon couldn't make it today, unfortunately, he's still traveling uh, the world, he's trotting the globe. Um, he will be here with us tomorrow, uh, I'm hopeful. Dr. Rajiv Shah, who's um, again well known in foot, Indian foot and ankle world. Um, Dr. Sampad Dume from Pune. And Dr. Balvinder Rana from Medanta Medicity in Delhi. And Dr. Amit Srivastav, um, who's now in Delhi as well. Sorry, Amit Bhargav, sorry. I got your surname wrong. A close friend of mine is a mystery roster. Um, so we're going to have a good time with all these people who are genuinely interested in foot and ankle. They do foot and ankle work, both in the UK and here. And we'll have a good mix of pathology from both sides. And you'll see lots of cases, lots of interaction. Um, we're just going to run through the program. There's some minor changes, fine tuning of the program. Um, essentially, just looking at this morning, we're going to stick to the plan as it is. Um, as I said, Simon Anderson um, is not here, so Mark uh, kindly stepped in for this morning's uh, talk for him. Um, we'll have a coffee break uh, after the first session. And then in the, in the second session, we've got a slight alteration. We have ankle fractures, then we have some controversies around the ankle fracture management. Then following that, we have uh, Dr. Rana's talk on pylone fractures. We'll have lunch after that, and then the, the plan is as, as shown on, in the program for you. Um, we will have List Frank video immediately after List Frank talk, which will make more sense. Uh, and then we'll have uh, breakup workshops after the coffee break on calcellian fractures, and also uh, we'll show you some tightrope from Arthrex. Day two program we'll run through tomorrow, so you know we'll just stick with today's program. And uh, we've got some goodies from the UK. So we've got some uh, stuff from Arthrex for tightrope, which they've kindly given. We've also got some stuff for Aquilon minimally invasive uh, tendon Achilles repair, which we'll show you tomorrow. Uh, the video technique and also uh, video of the technique and also the actual bits of the kit that we use for minimally invasive um, Achilles tendon. There are some house rules, and I've chosen my uh, big brother to talk about, talk about those. So, Harry, if I may. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Jitendra. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I've been invited here to, to be the policeman. <clears throat> uh, as you have just heard, the course is being run largely and loosely uh, on the format of the, the, the BOFAS foot and ankle principles course that's run in the UK uh, biannually at the moment, uh, particularly with regard to uh, attendance and um, uh, decorum in the course. Uh, please forgive me if I sound like a school teacher. Can I ask everybody individually to please switch off your mobile phones? It's an extremely disruptive uh, influence, both on the speakers and also on the people listening to the lecture. So can I please ask that you either switch them off or you please put them on silent. And that includes faculty, please. Uh, we'd like to keep this as a, as a rule. There'll be no punitive punishment, no whipping, but you'll be named and shamed. You'll be asked to stand up and say, sorry, this is my phone. So please put it on, on silent, if you may. <coughs> Attendance. Um, I have recognized that for some of you, you may have to have short breaks, etc. But I think it is important to recognize that if this is a course uh, that is designed to impart information and knowledge, there's little merit in offering an attendance certificate if you're not going to be in the course. So I think oh, it's not mandatory, but it is for your own benefit. Can I suggest that you stick to being within the, uh, the hall for as much of, the, uh, of the, the day as possible on both days. Uh, I'm not going to say that you will not get an attendance certificate, but it will be a meaningless certificate for you if you just got your attendance certificate and attended only two sessions. So I would urge you to attend 
as many, if not all, of the sessions if possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Harry. Um, the course program is in your, you've all uh, got it. Um, we will have feedback or evaluation forms individually uh, given to you. Please, please, please fill this out because A, it will tell us how things work, all the goods and bads of running a course. Uh, we do learn from you know, what you say and try and take it on board so that we can make it even better next time we deliver a course like this. So please fill in your evaluation forms. Okay, without further ado, I'm going to invite uh, Mr. Mark Davis to talk about surgical anatomy and approaches to the foot and ankle. Thanks, Mark. Um, and uh, I hope that uh, having taken on Simon Henderson's talk, it will combine nicely with uh, my second talk of the morning. And it's really all about the principles uh, uh, of how to approach a problem with in foot and ankle surgery. Um, Simon Henderson constructed a large part of this talk, and um, I've modified it for you today. So, the foot is a masterpiece of engineering and a work of art. This quotation from a very famous artist, philosopher, thinker, anatomist. Uh, and I think it's true, and that's why we're all here from the UK to try and impart our enthusiasm for this particular uh, aspect of uh, human anatomy and its pathology. So, as we all know, patients uh, uh, are very clear in, in their description of the, of the problem, and pain is, is predominantly a symptom that we see and recognize. So quite often, it's just very straightforward to ask the patient where, point with one finger, mark X with a spot, and locate where the pain is. And that pain may be in various places, and it may be located to various places very definitively. Um, but that's, that's important to note each of those areas. When does it come on? What are the factors that influence the exacerbating and relieving factors? And how much is it affecting your activities of daily living? How much disability is it causing you? So you can see on this foot here that there are a great deal of areas where there could potentially be a complaint. And it's important to make note of where the patient says the problem is. So I'm going to talk a little bit of having known that surface anatomy of the, of the presentation of the condition, talk a little bit about the applied anatomy. And for you guys, that's just really very basic revision. You guys will know it all anyway. So I'm going to talk a bit about the bones, the joints, muscular tendons, attachments, and neurovascular structures. And then we're going to go a little bit into uh, approaches, which I think are important. And I will reiterate and uh, introduce some other approaches in my second talk of the day. So, without meaning to teach you to suck eggs, here we've got the tibia, the calcaneus, the talus, and this is part of the hind foot. And then moving on to the midfoot, here we have the cuneiforms, the three of them there, the navicular, and the cuboid, and then into the metatarsals and the forefoot. Nothing new there. The ligaments, we're looking from both medially and laterally, and from uh, the front. So we have important ligaments like the CFL here, the anterior talofibular ligament, uh, here it is again, the syndesmotic ligaments, the anterior inferior tibiofibular ligament, and then the ligaments that make up the deltoid ligament, both the superficial and deep components. And it's just worthwhile remembering how, how important these structures are in terms of maintenance of uh, the foot shape. I won't name and shame. Looking at the anterior tendons here, you can see this on surface anatomy. You can see tib ant lying here. You can see quite often uh, EDC and sometimes tertius is visible. And EHL, you can see coursing down here. In terms of the posterior tendons, clearly the Achilles is sitting here with plantaris. Here's the superficial perineal retinaculum. And then you have uh, tib post and uh, the perinei on the lateral side. Again, looking from the lateral side here, with the foot everted, you can see the perinei are very clear uh, to demonstrate. 
And here you have uh, brevis, which we remember as being B, close to the bone, and longus, coursing underneath the uh, foot and attaching onto the undersurface of the uh, first metatarsal base. Medially, the, uh, the old mnemonic, uh, Tom, Dick and Harry, here's Tib Post, FDL and FHL here. Looking at the dorsum of the foot, well, we've briefly seen that already. So we have uh, Tib Ant coming down here, EHL, and then EDC here, and EHB coming in through here. On the sole of the foot, looking at the uh, most superficial layers, uh, you can see that you have the, the short flexes of the hallux and the short flexes of the lesser toes. In terms of the arteries, well, again, we'll come into this principally when we talk about the talus and the blood supply to the talus. Um, but we all know we have the dorsalis pedis, and, uh, which is sitting here, and then also the posterior tibial artery and its components there. And they're all anastomose um, to uh, supply blood to the various structures of the foot, which we'll go through a little bit more with the talus. In terms of the neurovascular supply, this slide here shows it very nicely. You can see the principal uh, sensa sensory supply to the um, foot um, and, the, and the, also the motor supply. And it's all marked out here nicely in the different colors. And that's worthwhile testing uh, specifically for neuromas, uh, but also to make sure that you're differentiating from a dermatomal distribution of uh, sensory loss. In terms of the telonavicular complex, where well, it's common, commonly known as the hip of the foot, so acetabuli pedis, the spring ligament is, is very important. We talk an awful lot about tip post insufficiency and flat foot, and the spring ligament is one of the key uh, structures that is uh, affected with uh, the deformity formation. And actually, the tip post is, is almost incidental. And what it does is the telonavicular joint is the apex of the longitudinal arch. Again, just taking you through some of the key articulations, the posterior facet here on, to, on the oscalsis, the middle facet and the anterior facet, and here's the navicular facet here. Just looking at perineal tendon dislocation, you can see that there is a difference between um, the anatomy sometimes with the deep depth of the groove here behind the fibula and the attachment of the uh, retinaculum. And you can see how there are different stages or grades in this particular classification for dislocation. And on the clinical photograph here, you can see uh, the dislocated perineal tendons. So as I said, we'll talk about the uh, talus blood supply, and we'll talk about that again briefly in the talk about talar fractures. But because the talus is about 60% covered in cartilage and has no muscular attachment, it does actually have a very limited blood supply. And that is very relevant, particularly in trauma, but actually we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that in the multiply operated uh, hindfoot, it, it does have some bearing. And that's important, particularly if you're thinking about doing ankle replacements and you have to do concurrent or even staged uh, hindfoot fusions. So just to remind you uh, of the blood supply, and I'll talk about a couple of the, one of the particularly key papers that's been published recently about it. So on the undersurface, it's really an anastomosis between the uh, medial and lateral inputs. And you can see here there's the posterior tibial artery that is one of the principal contributors here. And there is also contribu contribution through the deltoid ligament uh, and the vascular supply that it, that gives is very important, particularly to fractures on the medial aspect of the Taylor dome. Dorsalis pedis comes along here and uh, give, gives an anastomosis on the anterior aspect. And also, there is a perforating perineal artery coming from the lateral. So, sometimes with um, thinking about surgical approaches, it's, it's worthwhile actually taking on board a general philosophy uh, in terms of the surgical anatomy. And the idea is to gain access to the site of surgical interest by the easiest route, uh, by causing least structural uh, damage. And I think that's a key sort of philosophy to take on board. And again, I'll come back to that a little bit later and how that might be applied actually very practically. So again, just reiterating the arterial supply, 
anteriorly here through the anterior tibial artery and the dorsalis pedis. Um, you can see the, the lateral branches here. And all this has a bearing, really, when you're starting to consider your approach potentially for a calcaneal osteotomy or for calcaneal fracture fixation. Um, and again, here, just looking at the undersurface of the arterial anastomosis. So it's quite a rich supply, but you do have to be aware where the principal roots are. So if we're going to talk about calcaneal fixation, um, there is the uh, extended lateral approach, which is, is sometimes interpreted differently depending on whereabouts in the world uh, you come from. Because if you think about it from the Seattle approach, it's quite a short-limbed, uh, 90 degree bend in this area here and that tends to give you access for your calcaneal fracture. Roger Atkins in Bristol did some work on angiosomes and actually he's very very adamant the extended lateral approach should start almost from the midline here in the Achilles tendon come all the way down as far as here and subtend an angle of about 100 degrees before coursing anteriorly for the limb there to, in order for you to lift a very safe flap in trauma. And we must always remember to respect the soft tissues. This picture is not something that uh, you and I would be unfamiliar with, the blistering that is associated with high-violence calcaneal trauma. And in a way, you can almost see where the angiosomal supply will go because it's the glabrous skin of the plantar aspect of the foot that is largely protected here. And also, you can see here. Now, I wouldn't advocate you could make a surgical approach through that skin in its current state, but you can see where the angiosomes lie. So what we tend to do is allow the skin to wrinkle, uh, and you can clearly see on the slide here that that's happened. And at this stage, it's, it's safe then to undertake your internal fixation. So again, just to reiterate the uh, differences in what could be conceived as a, an extended lateral approach, this very 90 degree, what I call a Seattle type approach, and then more of what I would say a Bristol or a UK type of approach where the angle subtended is about 100 degrees. And here you can see with the uh, slides that there's dissection of a full thickness flap and that's really important to allow access to the calcaneum. Here is an interoperative view which clearly shows uh, how that is done and you can see that K wires are then placed one into the fibula, one into the tail and neck and that allows your uh, retraction. The idea is to try and preserve this flap by not interfering with a, a lot of uh, self-retention or um, Langenbeck uh, retraction. There it is with closure. So then to talk about the medial utility incision to the navicular. This is uh, uh, an important approach and I like the word utility because at any step along that way you can use this uh, incision. It tends to be internervous, it's not quite true, but it tends to be and it tends to be lie between the tib post and the anterior tibial tendons and it allows you a very nice access to the talus, to the navicular, to the cuneiforms and to the first metatarsal and it's a real workhorse incision. It said it's uh, as an internervous plane. It isn't quite true because there is a little bit of overlap and crossover here, but I don't think that's necessarily perceived by the patient and doesn't seem to cause any trouble. I tend to mark the skin each time that uh, I do the, any operation on the foot, and that's just because I want to make sure that I've palpated any bony landmarks to make sure I go in exactly the right place. That way there's as little undermining as possible and to and make soft tissue handling uh, optimal. And here you can see uh, this is an approach here where FDL has been harvested through this um, approach and you can see the knot of Henry uh, deep in the wound there. Approach to the first MTP joint. Uh, MTP joint. I have to say, I wouldn't be dogmatic about this. I think everyone has their favorite approach to uh, the MTP joint, and I think a large part of that is dependent on your philosophy. Personally, I'm a dorsal approacher, partly because I think uh, if I'm going to do a chylectomy, I may have to come back uh, in future years, and therefore it's important that I don't make two cuts. Um, Having said that, if I'm going to do a bunion operation, I tend to use a scarf osteotomy, then I'll effectively use the length of that uh, utility medial approach. 
the key thing is to be very, very mindful of the dorsomedial nerve. And so long as you are mindful, then I don't think that will cause any problems. So considering our approaches to the, the talus, uh, the anterolateral approach is uh, one of the advocated approaches. I have to say, principally because Taylor fractures tend to cause comminution on the medial aspect, then this is often, if used, an auxiliary approach, just to make sure that your reduction is as complete as possible. And you see here one of the structures at risk is a superficial perineal nerve, and that needs to be preserved and thought about at all times. Marked out the skin incision here, affords good access into the lateral aspect of the tail and neck uh, and also onto the lateral process. And it is extendable. It's in line with the fourth metatarsal and you can see that the dots there clearly demonstrate that. The deep dissection again, making sure that uh, you're aware of the nerve. And EDB muscle belly is, a, is a, a very sort of key landmark. It allows you to work out where the anterior process is, where the cuboid is, and where the lateral aspect of the talus is. So tail neck fractures, primarily, as I said, the comminution medially, and that's because it tends to be a various medially directed force. Um, and the, the lateral surface tends to fail in tension. So um, it's quite often that the complexity of the fracture is medial and that there is some simplicity to the lateral fracture, and that's worthwhile knowing. And the idea of uh, doing a combined approach is to try and uh, reduce the chance of malreduction, which is in, in some series, up to 60% of cases. Anterior medial approach, which is uh, the workhorse, Again, thinking about the uh, internervous plane, but it's effectively that extended utility incision medially that I've approached before. And here it is marked out. So we've got the tib post tendon marked, tib ant tendon, and it's approximately midway between the two. It's worthwhile thinking about in trauma that it's, it, it's good to try and have nice, deep, uh, thick incisions rather than a lot of undermining. The saphenous vein is quite often sitting in the area. And you have to be mindful of the medial deltoid ligament uh, blood supply because uh, that's going to often be your only preserved uh, supply after an injury. So here you can see the uh, medial tail and neck fracture that has been exposed through this approach. Very little undermining here. And it's important with some of the more later papers about the blood supply to the talus to try and avoid going and dissecting plantarwoods and also to the, onto the top of the tail and neck. And then finally, just think, considering about uh, ankle arthroscopy portals because uh, more and more arthroscopic surgery is being performed. And what we tend to do, particularly in my practice, is to establish an anteromedial portal. So I tend to feel where the tib ant tendon is. And then I tend to try and move it slightly laterally and put my thumb where I'm going to put my incision and then make a nick between that um, uh, and the malleolus. And the idea is to try and avoid the saphenous uh, nerve and the vein, but also to try and uh, avoid any damage to uh, the tibial, uh, anterior tibial tendon. And then I establish the anterior lateral portal from inside out. And that's a question of transilluminating structures because quite often the superficial perineal nerve, which is clearly visible here, if you uh, flex the fourth toe, it is a very visible structure in a slim person. But that with the combination of uh, transillumination is a good way to establish your anterolateral uh, portal. And remember, the literature at one point has quoted a 10% neural injury uh, with ankle arthroscopy. And it's very useful uh, to know that uh, I think in dedicated foot and ankle surgeons, that that complication is much, much less. And certainly in my practice, it isn't as high as that. So I kept it very brief. I'm going to come back to some more approaches um, when I talk about the principles of trauma management. Um, but that's uh, just an overview of the anatomy and some of the philosophies of uh, managing um, foot and ankle problems. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, excellent talk, really, to kick off with. Uh, we've got Patricia Ellen next, who will um, teach us, give us a master class on how to examine foot and ankle. Um, and I think it's quite useful to do a good clinical exam because 90% of your, particularly in elective, 
for for ankle pathology, your diagnosis is, is based on clinical examination. So over to Patricia Allen. Thank you. In that last talk. Um, we would really appreciate it if people turned off their mobile phones so that it's not constantly disturbing this, the course, because we really would like you to attend the whole, the whole thing to be able to actually get a good grasp of what we're, what we're saying today. Right. So I'm going to talk about foot and ankle examination. And what I hope that you'll be able to gain from this session is to establish some, a, a simple system for examining the foot and ankle so that you can elicit the appropriate clinical signs to make a working diagnosis. By the end of your history and examination, you should then know what the diagnosis is and you should use investigations to confirm your diagnosis, not to make your diagnosis. So the examination starts with the history. And Mark already elucidated this earlier on in that most patients will complain of pain and they will tell you where it is. And therefore, a knowledge of the surface anatomy of the foot will help you because by and large in the foot, unlike around the hip, etc., pain is not referred. If it's painful, it's, it's something underneath that area that tends to be the cause, the cause of it. So your history directs your examination to tell you whether that problem is in the hind foot, the midfoot, the forefoot, or whether it's a complex problem that's got a combination of pathologies, both hind foot and forefoot, say. It will also give you an idea about the pathology as to whether it's an underlying joint pathology, whether there's something wrong with the bones inherently, or soft tissue. Bear in mind that we are not hip surgeons. We are not dealing with one joint. As Mark said, the foot is a very complex biomechanical structure. It is not a single joint, and it has a number of functions. And when we're examining the foot, we need to remember what the functions of the foot are. We may not all want to stand on point. We may not all want to put our feet into shoes quite like this, but the foot does need to be adaptable. Your foot has to be stable. You have to be able to stand flat on your foot in stance and for it to stay where it is and not collapse. But it has to be flexible enough to actually accommodate for uneven ground, say, but also to just to give you the flexibility to walk across different surfaces. Within that, it also needs to be able to propel you so that you can change from standing to walking to running, and your foot has to adapt to those differences and has to be able to change. Feet are not all the same. No foot is obviously uniform, and so therefore our examination is not uniform. And whilst I have a, a system that I go through whenever I see a patient, there are certain special things that I do in certain types of foot that I don't do for every foot. You can't do everything for every one foot. So I'm going to predominantly talk about the normal foot, but bearing in mind the, the major things that we may see, be it the flat foot or a cavus foot, and we'll talk about some special tests. So as we said, your examination will confirm your clinical suspicion. We're going to go through the standard examination and talk about some special uh, tests that we may do in certain situations and hope that we get a logical sequence so that you can actually think about things as you go along. By and large, my system is, first off, to get your patient to stand. Look at them standing and walking, sit them down, and then we'll look at special tests, both for the underlying pathology, but also we are, of course, surgeons, and we may want to operate on this patient, so we need to evaluate them as to whether they are actually a surgical candidate. So what do I do? I'm going to go through this in more detail in a minute. When they're standing up, obviously we want to watch them walk. We want to watch them when they're standing from all views. We want to get them to stand on tiptoes, both two legs and single leg, stand on their heels and on each board of the foot, ski stance, and then look at proprioception. So, is that going to actually work? No. So when we're walking, what do we look at? We look at the position that the foot's in, the position that the foot is in in a heel strike, the position at toe off, what happens to the foot during, uh, during stance, whether they've got a limp of any form, whether they've got a foot drop, whether they've got leg length discrepancies, etc. When they're standing, you can again look at the whole leg. We want them, obviously, um, exposed from at least the thighs down. Look at whether they've got any calf wasting. You can assess whether they've got leg length discrepancy. 
A knee deformity clearly has a bearing on where the foot is. If your foot is in gross, if your knee, sorry, is in gross valgus, then that's going to have a bearing on what the position of the foot is. And if you're going to think about correcting that foot, then obviously the, there's big implications if you do something to the foot to put the foot flat on the ground, and the knee surgeons then decide to straighten the knee out. So we need to think about the proximal joints. Look for any old scars that may give you an idea about what's going on if you, before previous trauma or previous surgery, whether they've got any swelling, etc., around the foot or ankle. You can assess the underlying foot shape. Look at the position that their heel is in. Look at the arch. Look at the alignment of the forefoot to the hind foot. And then we'll look at the forefoot and, their, and the position of the toes. So look at the calf. Is it wasted? And if so, is there an associated leg length discrepancy? To give you an idea that there might be something more global going on, or there might be something that's something going on with the spine. And it may be that you need to actually look at the spine to see if there's any, um, gives you any idea that there might be some form of spinal dysrhaphism, for example. We look at the foot shape, but what's also important is not just their foot shape, but also whether the foot has changed in shape. And the patients will obviously tell you that. You've obviously got the other foot to compare it with, and that will give you an idea about what their normal foot shape is. We are all different. Some have very high arched feet, some have a more normal arch, some feet are very flat. This is obviously pretty much always um, uh, um, pathologic if you've got a um, the calcaneus foot where you've got a big um, a rocker bottom type deformity. But it's the change in the, in the shape of the foot that actually is important uh, because we are different. So for example, you can see in here, don't, we've got two legs and we are symmetrical so in here this is obviously their normal foot and on this foot which is pathological they've got a high arch and the heels in a lot of varus on this it's the opposite again your normal foot but this foot's gone meandering off to the side and the hind foot is in a lot of valgus we can then get the patient to support themselves against the wall and stand up on their tiptoes what normally happens if we look at the heel when you stand on tiptoes, the heel should swing into varus. And it does so because of the movement that's occurring at the subtalar joint. So therefore, if you look at a patient and see whether they assess whether their heel is moving into varus, by definition, you have to have a mobile functioning subtalar joint for that to happen. So your subtalar joint has to be uh, mobile for your heel to swing into varus. But you also need a functioning tibialis posterior tendon because that's the thing that's going to actually lift your body weight against the foot that's fixed on the ground. So whilst it is an assessment of tibialis posterior, you do need a functional uh, a mobile subtalar joint, but also you need some integrity of the plantar fascia, because there is some evidence to show that a good percentage of that heel raise is actually achieved also by the plantar fascia and its integrity. So you can see here, here's a patient with a unilateral flat foot. When they go up onto their tiptoes, the heel does start to correct. They're not able to go as high, but if you do that, you then, you may be able to assess them on two, two heels. They may preferentially load the normal leg. So you need to assess what's going on in the pathological side. So then you can ask them to do a single leg heel raise. And often ask them to do it repeatedly because in early tibialis posterior dysfunction, you may be able to do a, a single leg heel raise at once and the heel will swing into varus. But if you ask them to do it two or three times, the tendon will tire easily and they will no longer swing into varus. So while we're looking at hind foot position, one of the special tests that we may do is if you have a foot with a cavus deformity, what you want to know is whether that hind foot is flexible. Is that varus correctable? And for that, we do the Coleman block test. The basis behind it is obviously that in an early cavus deformity, one of the prime problems is a fixed plantar flexion of the first metatarsal, and that will drive your hind foot into varus. So to assess its flexibility, you accommodate for that. You put a block underneath the lateral border of the forefoot and the heel. Personally, I find that the patients, that's, it's quite difficult to stand with a block of an inch underneath your foot and actually put some weight through that leg. So I even them out and put a block underneath the other leg as well because I think you get a much better idea of what's going on. So you can see here this foot's in varus. You accommodate for the plantar flex first ray and now that heel has swung out and that looks like a much more normal foot. So you know that that is a, a forefoot driven deformity and your hind foot is flexible. 
So this is in pictorial form, so you can see with a cavus foot, effectively the problem is a plantar flex first ray, so your block is coming under here and is accommodating for this. And normally, obviously, when they walk, rather than standing just on their first metatarsal head, the heel swings into varus to accommodate it. You can then ask them to stand on their heels. That will tell you that their ankle dorsiflexors are functional and are a good power. And if you ask them to walk on their heels, you can see that well. If you ask them to stand on the medial and lateral borders of the foot, you've gained now a huge amount of information before even laying hands on your patient that you can tell what the position and the shape of the foot is, whether the tibialis posterior is functional, whether the anterior tendons are functional, whether your hind foot deformity, say, is fixed or flexible, and whether you've got mobile hind foot joints. Because if you can have a symmetrical range of hind foot of movement here, then you know that you actually you've got good movement in all your hind foot joints, and you know a lot before you've touched your patient. If you get them to squat down, keeping their heels uh, on the ground into ski stance, that will give you an idea about whether there's any, anything anteriorly blocking anti ankle uh, dorsiflexion. So then you can get them lying down. Do not forget, obviously, that there is the sole of the foot, which often hides things. So look for callosities, if they've got any ulcers, etc., on the sole of the foot. And then once they're lying down, you can start to actually examine the patient by uh, looking for tenderness around the joints and then assessing the range of movement of the joints. Personally, I start at the back and work forwards. I don't suppose it particularly matters if you start on the forefoot and work backwards, but you do need to have a logical, uh, logical uh, progression through the examination. Uh, and as we've said before, your history will direct you as to how you're going to examine that foot and what special tests you may need to do. So if we start with the ankle, we're going to look for tenderness around the anterior aspect of the ankle and look at its range of movement, which obviously is just purely into plantar flexion, dorsiflexion, and compare it with the opposite side. We also may want to look, depending on what the history is, what we may think uh, the underlying diagnosis is. We may need to assess ligaments in terms of instability. We may need to specifically look for signs of posterior impingement, and we may want to assess the perineal tendons as well as tibialis posterior. So just to go back to a bit of surface anatomy, obviously, because the important thing around the foot and ankle is where the joints are. Your patient may say, I've got pain in my ankle, but unless you actually get them to point to where it is, actually that could cover a multitude of sins. And you know, many patients that say it's my ankle actually point down here towards the tail and navicular joint. They may point laterally to give you an idea that it's more subtalar joint. Ankle joint pain tends to be felt anteriorly between the malleoli. Subtalar pain is felt laterally and sometimes medially, laterally around the sinus tarsi. Ternonavicular pain is over the dorsum of the foot, but it's only a finger breadth away from the ankle. The ternonavicular joint is really quite proximal. And then your navicular form is only another, another centimetre further down. So remember where the joints are. So you can palpate around the ankle, around the joint line, down the lateral malleoli, medial malleoli, uh, malleolus, down into the sinus tarsi, around the subtalar joint and along the joint. Perineal, obviously running behind the uh, um, fibula, down towards fifth metatarsal head, and perineus longus underneath uh, the cuboid, at about the calcaneal cuboid level. If we're going to assess tibialis posterior, that's running behind the medial malleolus. You want to ever the foot in plantar flexion to take away the action of tibialis anterior and ask them then to invert against resistance. And what you're looking for to see is here, they're actually starting to recruit tibialis anterior. So you can't see tibialis posterior working. You want to look at whether that tendon is functioning and palpate it at the same time as feeling it, as uh, uh, assessing it. So as we've said, if we're looking at the hind foot joints, you want to isolate the joints, i.e. you want to look and feel as to whether those joints are individually moving. So if I'm looking at the uh, subtalar joint, then I want to hold the heel and I want to have my hand on the navicular tuberosity and the cuboid to assess what movement is going on around the tenonavicular and calcaneal cuboid joint. I want to hold the tibia and the oscalcis if I'm just examining the subtalar joint to assess pure movement there. We're going to look at the tender Achilles, plantar fascia, and we'll talk about Jack's test. Uh, obviously, we may need to assess the tarsal tunnel. And then don't forget to look at the alignment of the forefoot to the hind foot. So going back again, so ankle joint we've said is here, 
We know where the subtalar joint we talked about. So I find that if you hold one hand, your, your heel in one hand, and hold tibia and fibula, you can then assess inversion, eversion at the subtalar joint. Me, this is medial malleolus. This is the navicular tuberosity. There's another little knobbly bit of bone that forms a sort of right angle triangle, which is the sustentaculum talus, which gives you an idea about where the medial border of the subtalar joint is. So if you want to assess the talonavicular joint, you have to hold the, the tuberosity of the navicular and the cuboid laterally, and the other hand hold your, hold your uh, oscalsis to actually assess the rotation uh, and, and uh, abduction and adduction occurring at those two joints. Jack's test is basically to look at the integrity of the plantar fascia. In the resting position here, you can see you've got a normal arch, but if you dorsiflex the toe, what you're doing is winding up the plantar fascia, which is a fixed length tie bar, effectively, underneath the foot, and as you dorsiflex the toe here, by th this will pull up the arch and it will raise the arch, and you know then what's happening. It will also start to pull the heel into varus, which is why, as we said before, when you're going up onto your tiptoes, some of that heel varus is, caused, is, is, is because of the integrity of the plantar fascia, not just tibialis posterior. Then, if you look at the foot, hold the heel in your hand and correct that alignment, and then look at where the forefoot is. So if we draw a line along the bottom of the, foot, the, the heel here, and then draw a line along the forefoot, you can see that this forefoot is pronated in comparison to the hind foot. So you've got a rotatory deformity within the foot, between hind foot and forefoot. Here you've got the opposite. The forefoot is supinated, I twisted it medially in comparison to the hind foot alignment. So you need to assess that, just to look at where within the foot the deformity is. And then, once you've worked out what the deformity is, is it correctable? So are the joints still mobile, or is that deformity fixed somewhere? And if it's fixed, is it fixed within the bones or the joints, or a combination of the two? So we can see here, if your heel is in neutral, obviously normally when you stand, your heel's in neutral, your heel's on the floor, and all your toes are on the floor. If you've got your heel in valgus and your foot is on the floor, then the question is, is that a foot able to do that because the foot's flexible in the mi middle, or if you correct your hind foot to, vet, to put your heel in neutral, is the forefoot effectively supinated and it's driving the hind foot down into valgus? And the same goes, we've talked about before, your heel varus. If the foot is flat on the ground, that is compensated, compensating for the fact that the first ray is relatively plantar flexed. So look at that alignment. In terms of the joints around the midfoot, we can palpate the individual tarsal metatarsal joints. And particularly, we often want to know about the stability of the first meta tarsal metatarsal joint uh, in terms of hallux valgus surgeries to whether the, your prime problem is uh, first TMT joint instability. So if you hold the first metatarsal in one hand and the lesser metatarsals in the other hand, you can then, holding it at the metatarsal head here, you can then dorsiflex, plantar flex, and assess what movement you've got that's occurring between first and the lesser metatarsals to see whether that joint is unstable. We can look at the position of the forefoot. What's the position of the hallux, and is that correctable? Is the joint itself painful, or is it a painless deformity that just needs to be corrected? Look at the lesser toes. What, where are they? Have they gone out into valgus? Is one of them underriding, overriding? Are those deformities fixed, or are they flexible? We also need to look at coronal plane deformities, and as well as whether they're dorsally or um, plantar subluxed. We'll look at each the lesser MTP joints as well, as to whether they've got any suggestion of synovitis or laxity at those joints. Then we may move on to some special tests in the forefoot, particularly if we think that they may have got a neur Morton's neuroma, to look for specific tenderness between the metatarsal heads and a Mulder's click. And then never forget, of course, that we are surgeons. We are looking at the whole patient as well, at their vascular and neurological status, if we are thinking about doing anything to them. So in terms of lesser toe deformities, it's obviously a normal toe. A mallet toe is just when, obviously, when the tip is uh, uh, flexed. Hammer toe, it's also flexed um, at the MTP joint, flexed at the PIP and often extended at the DIP joint. Claw toe, where they're dorsiflexed at the MTP joint uh, and both the IP joints are flexed. 
So you want to know whether each of those deformities is, uh, is fixed or flexible. In terms of what's happening at the MTP joint, we can assess the, uh, whether they've got some synovitis at the MTP joint by palpating each individual MTP joint. And then if you hold the metatarsal head with the thumb and finger and hold the proximal phalanx with the opposite hand, you can actually translate that proximal phalanx dorsally or plantarwards, particularly dorsally, and you can feel it sublux if you've got any laxity within that MTP joint, which will give you the, uh, uh, may you realize that there is obviously some synovitis and some swelling uh, and instability at that uh, MTP joint. So that's what we're trying to achieve. So we're holding the metatarsal head and the proximal phalanx, and you can see that what we're trying to work out is whether it is translating dorsally. And you can see this here, where we're pushing up the toe, and you can see this is where the, you can see a sort of sulcus here, uh, where the joint is. Mulder's click, if we think there's a Morton's neuroma, then palpate from dorsal to plantar between the uh, intermetatarsal space that you think the Morton's is in. And then you can also squeeze the forefoot from medial to lateral. And sometimes if you've held it here, you can feel the click as the, as the neuroma is being moved between the metatarsal heads or the patients may, may feel it uh, themselves as well. So in summary then, do not forget that your examination actually does start with your history. Listen when you're taking the history because the patient will tell you what the diagnosis is if you ask them the right questions and if you listen to what they are saying. Keep it simple. Do not forget to look at them standing up. We want to look at them sitting down. You need a logical approach where you're thinking about what's going on underneath. The work from posterior to anterior, I find that's the easiest way to, to, to look at it. And do not forget to look at what's going on within the foot, so whether there's any rotation between the hind foot and forefoot. You then tailor your examination to the special tests to the situation that, you're, that you have, depending on their, uh, both their symptoms and what their foot, the foot shape looks like. And as I said, remember that you are a surgeon, so consider the whole patient. You must remember the proximal joints and don't forget their neurovascular status at the end. So if we want to say what are our take-home messages, your examination is there to confirm your clinical suspicion, which should be there from the history, and it should allow you to make a sensible working diagnosis so that you have got a really good idea about what's going on in that patient before you start to order special tests. You do not need to CT and MRI everybody. The patient will tell you the diagnosis, uh, and simple examination will, will confirm that. Have a logical approach. Think about what the foot functions are at the same time as your examination and have a logical approach in how you're examining it and remember the foot function and how the mechanics of it work. Thank you. That's excellent, uh, Trish. Um, but we do have to supplement it with further investigations. And now Dr. Shah is going to talk about what are the uh, investigations you're going to do and what approach you should have to uh, investigating foot and ankle. Dr. Shah, thank you. Thank you. Good morning to all. See, when we talk about modalities which are being commonly used, Broadly, X-rays we use to define bone abnormalities. Ultrasound, it evaluates soft tissues and can be used in office. MRI largely evaluates osteomyelitis, occult fractures, partial and complete tears of the tendon made by Achilles, tip post, or peroneae. It could as well be helpful in plantar fasciitis, neuromas, tarsal tendon syndrome. And obviously, you do go ahead sometimes with CT scan and bone scan. So over and above all these modalities, I'm also going to discuss about or brief, give brief about certain uncommon modalities which are also being used. So let's go ahead first with the X-rays. And typical ankle X-ray series, you get lateral AP and mortised view of the ankle. And what are the typical ankle radiology signs? There are nine signs which you look for. In an AP ankle X-ray, you look for tibiofibular clear space, tibiofibular overlap, talar tilt angle, lateral talar shift, 
sentence line and arcuate line. While in the oblique view, you look for these three signs, medial clear space, talocrural angle, and ankle instability sign. And let's go ahead and look at all this. The distance between the medial border of the fibula and the incisura border of distal tibia, which is one cm above ankle joint, is labeled as tibiofibular clear space. Normally it is 5 mm. If it is widened, that means there is mal reduction of the fibula. Uh, look at this. This is how you measure the space. And this is how it gets disrupted in a mal united fracture. The distance between the medial border of fibula and the lateral border of the distal tibia again one centimeter above the ankle joint line on AP view normally is 10 mm. And that is called as tibiofibular overlap. If it is less than 10 mm, then you are dealing with some kind of syndesmotic malunion. Look at the uh, normal picture. This is how you mark this and this is how it would be disrupted in a malunited case. The another important parameter you look is stellar tilt. Normally it is less than 2 degree of angulation. Almost practically they are parallel. This two uh, angle between a line parallel to the upper surface of talus and a line parallel to the long axis of tibia. You have to sometimes compare it with the opposite side keeping the same distance uh, of your tube. And if it is more than 2 degree, that means it indicates there is either medial or lateral disruption. So this is how you do it and this is how you see for the disruption. The another less significant sign is lateral talar shift. The inner medial border of fibula and the outer lateral border of the talus is compared with that of the opposite side for the width and it signifies a lateral talar shift like this in a normal and an abnormal case. The another line which is of importance is a sentence line of ankle which is a line of articular surface. It runs from the articular surface of medial malleolus right up to the talus, uh, up to the uh, uh, lateral malleolus. And you also need to compare it with the opposite side in many cases. This is how you mark it and you ought to know what are the abnormalities. When a line connecting medial inferior surface of lateral malleolus to the lateral inferior talar surface is drawn, it forms a complete ball and this is called as arcuate line. This is the surest sign of fibular shortening and malunion. You may like to compare it with the opposite side intraoperatively. And this is how it would be disrupted in a mal position, mal fixed ankle. Then comes the mortise view. It's a 15 degree internal rotation move, no, um, uh, view wherein you measure a talocrural angle. It is a denominator of mal position of talus into the ankle mortise. The first important sign you see is a medial clear space. It's the space between the lateral border of medial malleolus and the medial border of talus. Normally it is less than 4 mm. And it indicates any abnormality would indicate a lateral talar shift. Look at this. This is a normal one and this is the abnormal one. In a mortise we also see talocrural angle. It is an angle between perpendicular from distal tibial articular surface and a line drawn from tips of medial and lateral malleoli. Normally it is 83 plus or minus 4. You also need to compare it with the opposite side. It suggests malposition of talus into ankle mortise. This is how normal it is drawn. This is how the abnormal would look like. The another and probably the most accurate and reproducible sign is the mod, it is the ankle instability sign. You have to compare medial clear space, the width of the medial clear space with the width of the ankle joint space and larger medial clear space than the superior clear space would signify, if this space is larger than this space, it would signify instability into the ankle and that is how you can also compare it with the opposite side. So look at this, this is ankle instability side. In a lateral view what you would be looking at would be the dome of the talus, whether it is centered, under and congruous with the tibial platform or not, you would be looking at the posterior malleolus, 
whether it is well reduced, what is the position, and you would also look at the evolution injuries of the talus, it would be uh, seen anteriorly. So this is how you would look at the posterior malleolar fracture, the size, tap, reduction, and position of the talus, and this is how it would be abnormally looking like. In a lateral view, also look at the neutral triangle. You also look at the bowler's angle, which can be depressed in both intra as well as extra articular calcaneal fracture. And you also look at the crucial angle of Gesen, wherein reconstruction of this angle is of paramount importance when you are dealing with calcaneal fractures. In a lateral view, also look at the Hegel's deformity. Any bone which is above this parallel line of Paolo's would be additional bone which you would need to get, which you would need to remove when you are operating these cases. You also look at the posterior heel pathologies in a lateral view. This is one of the very, very important view. I have found it to be very, very useful in clinical practice. That's a broadens view, wherein the foot is rotated 45 degree internally and you are firing your X-ray beam cranially 10, 20, 30 and 40 degree towards the tip of the lateral malleolus and this is how you see the whole posterior facet as you go from posterior to anterior. This is a very, very important thing intraoperatively for you to assess the reduction while you are operating fracture of calcaneus. Even I use this view to analyze my fusions of the subtalar joint like in this case. This 10, 20, this is 30 and 40. Axillary or Harris view you take in for looking at the breadth and the height of the heel. This is how you can take it. The another important view is Canal and Kelly's view. It's an excellent view of the medial talar neck. It's a medial columnar view wherein foot is plantar frax.